Welcome everybody online. Um, just to let you know, for those who watch online, we don't have a real easy way to let you know this because sometimes we're not going to be able to do the live stream right at 11 because we are making plenty of room for the Holy Spirit to move however he wants to move. And so just know that uh, at this point we're not, we're not feeling led to live stream the worship time, just only the message. So just know if we don't start right at 11, you know, just assume hopefully that nothing's wrong, that the Lord's actually moving. So we just had a really sweet presence of God come into the service, and uh, that's very, just raise your hand if you feel like God was touching you. <clears throat> yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Let's not take that for granted because it's precious. It's a precious work of the Spirit. I believe it's the signal of the day that we live in right now. In fact, the title of this message, I felt just from the Lord just to put a, a one-week pause on the teaching of indwelling life to talk about the days of his presence. Just even in response to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Asbury and breaking out into many college campuses, I just believe we're in that time period of of what scripture has called the days of his presence. It's an incredible time to be alive. It's an amazing time to be alive. It's the, it's the church's finest hour. It truly is the church's finest hour. And so I just want to bring a message to you today about the days of his presence and just what an incredible time period we live in. Um, if, if you feel discouraged, hopeless, I just want to tell you, you have been born into the hour that the saints in heaven are looking at, jealous and envious of you, because it really is the church's finest hour. We are privileged beyond anything we could ever ask or know or realize that we are alive during this time, the days of his presence. Now, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 24, verse 37. I just want to start with this passage of scripture, and I want to bring it from a different angle that you may have not ever thought about, but it's a very important, important way to think about this. Matthew 24, verse 37, and even when we were praying this morning, the Lord gave Angie the phrase, a paradigm shift. And I believe that it is a paradigm shift the Lord wants to bring to us about the days we live in, the end times, the last days that we live in. Matthew 24, verse 37, is the Lord compares it to the days of Noah. And the Lord says, he was asked the question, tell us the sign of the, your coming in the end of the age. And the Lord said, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. I want to pause there for a second, and I want to draw your attention to this phrase, Days, the days of Noah. So the coming of the Son of Man is over many days. It's not just the coming in his second coming, though it leads to that. The coming of the Son of Man, just see where it says, the days of Noah, the days of Noah. The coming of the Son of Man will be over many days. And I don't mean, what I really mean is over a lengthy time period in spanning into years, perhaps 10 years, perhaps 15 years, perhaps 25 years. I don't know exactly how many years it is, but I believe with all my heart that day has begun. We're in the countdown to the Lord's second coming. I believe that with all my heart. I don't know if the Lord's coming back in 10 years. I don't know if he's coming back in 15 years. 25 years, I don't know exactly, I know, but I am convinced that we are living in the days of his coming. So I want you to think about, just for a second, the Lord's coming is over many days, is over a season, is over many years. Now with that in mind, I want to hit on a, a little phrase here. Is the Lord, when he said, when the Lord said that my coming, 
When he said the coming of the Son of Man will be like the days of Noah, when the Lord said the word coming, it was the Greek word parousia. Parousia. Some people say par parousia, but it's really pronounced. I go to blueletterbible.org and hit the, because I always say the Greek word's wrong. It's parousia. But that guy has like a Greek accent, so I'm not going to try that. But parousia, the, this word parousia means presence. The days leading to the second coming of Jesus Christ, I'm just going to say 15 years. I don't know if it's 15 years, but just to, just to help us kind of solidify this, this 15-year period from now until the Lord's second coming are marked by the days of God's presence. We are living right now in the days of God's presence. What an incredible time to be alive. This is only... I'm telling you, what we just experienced is only the very beginning. It's not, I mean, it's not even the beginning of the beginning. It's probably the beginning of the beginning of the beginning. I mean, it's like, it's nothing. I, I, mean, I don't, I don't want to disrespect it, the, the, the touch of God that was here, but where we're moving into the days of his presence, it is unlike anything this world has ever seen before. The next 10 to 15 to 25 years, that lead to the second coming of Jesus Christ is going to be the gradual increase of the power and the glory of God unlike anything this world has ever seen. Far greater than the book of Acts when it's all said and done. The miracles done in the book of Acts far greater than the judgments Moses released on Pharaoh, far greater than what Elisha and Elijah did, far greater than all of that, the, the increasing presence of God that culminates in the second coming of Jesus Christ when he returns in power and great glory. We are living in those days. And we've just tasted a sample of that. Thank God for his grace to give us that. When Peter was describing the transfiguration, he used the word parousia to describe the transfiguration of Jesus in 1 Peter. First, or 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. Peter used that word parousia and he says, Beloved, I told you of the coming and the power. That when we saw, we were eyewitnesses of the coming of Jesus Christ. Of the presence of Jesus Christ. We were eyewitnesses of, that, of his presence. We were eyewitnesses. We beheld it with our very own eyes. And he used the word parousia to say, say, describe the Lord's coming. It was, we beheld that presence of the Lord. And you look, you look at the words, the, you look at the transfiguration of Jesus. I don't believe that transfiguration was like flipping on a light switch. And in one moment, Jesus was like a, a na, in his human form, just like the Jewish carpenter. And then the next second, he's shining with such intensity of light that his face is shining like the sun. I believe it was more of this gradual increase of the presence of God, presence of light, presence of glory until finally it got to this place where his clothes were white and his face was like the sun and the, and the three apostles with them were like, we got to just, you know, Peter wanted to build a tabernacle to him, but Moses and Elijah appeared. But my point is that this parousia, this parousia, I did it, everyone says parousia, it's parousia, this parousia of the Lord is, I believe, is, is going to be this gradual increase of the presence of the Lord culminating with inten intensifying glory and power leading to that time when Jesus Christ returns in great power and glory with his angels in blazing fire. See, I think we need a paradigm shift of the way we view the end times because so many believers have this fearful mindset of this fear and dread that's like, you know, it's going to be this time of terrible times of earthquakes and natural disasters and persecution and war and economic upheaval and all these things. 
that's true. That's true. But I want to say we don't need to be afraid of any of that. We need to, be, we need to fear the Lord because these are the days of his presence. We need to shift the mindset. You know, there's a lot of, I, I teach on the end times, so a lot of times when you mention the word end times, there's this inner cringe inside of people, this trigger. You say the word end times, and this, this thing triggers them, and they just get all up, you know, because they have all these, these memories and these thoughts of what that means. And, and so I just want to change the paradigm here is that, yes, Yes, the end times are going to be challenging. Yes, the end times are going to be a challenge like we've never experienced. But the presence of God is going to be unlike anything we have ever known. You don't want to be raptured out of here. <laughs> you want to experience what God is going to do at the end of the age. Incredible, incredible, incredible times. Just the, the idea, just think about this, is I, I, just, I just put this, I just came up with this phrase is, we live in the days of the earth-shaking presence of God. He's literally going to shake the earth as his presence increases. I'm quoting, I'm, I'm thinking of Isaiah chapter 2, verse 19. That day when the Lord rises up, that day when the Lord rises up, he's going to shake the earth mightily. We think of the end times as like all these bad things happening and, you know, you know the church is hiding in the corner from the Antichrist. No, God himself the Lord Jesus Christ is rising up. And as he's rising up, his parousia is being released. His presence is increasing to such an extent that his rising up, his presence shakes the earth. This is not the devil going off and doing this as if God is going, okay, you've got a lot of the power. No, it's the rising up of Jesus Christ in his second coming that's triggering all of this. The days of his presence. The days of his presence. The manifest presence of God is going to go from glory to glory to glory. Unlike anything we've ever known or seen, I'm convinced in my heart is going to be greater than the book of Acts. Jesus himself said in John 14, 12, greater works will you do because I go to the Father. It's even going to, it's hard to even imagine. I believe it's true. There is going to be at the end of the age greater works than what Jesus even did. That's hard to imagine. But I believe it. I believe it just because I believe the scriptures teach it. But here's what I want you to kind of think about. For the repentant, and I thank God for the repentance that came this morning. For the repentant, the increase of his parousia, the increase of his presence, the increase of God's glory as he rises up towards his second coming, it's going to mean revival, restoration, reformation, and bridal readiness for the repentant. But for the unrepentant, it's going to mean judgment and wrath. What's going to be, be the most incredible time in the history of the church is going to be the most terrible time for the unrepentant. Because God himself is rising up with great power to take over this planet and rule and reign. I'm telling you, we are living at that transitional period. We are living in the most pivotal time in human history. Incredible times of the very presence of God that is, that is increasing and increasing and increasing. His presence is literally going to shake the earth. His, par, his parousia, parousia, that's a hard word to say. It's this gradual increase of God's presence. I'm going to talk about this in the message, but I believe 
we are at the very beginning stages of this initial outpouring. The very beginning of the beginning of this initial outpouring. I believe what God did at Asbury and this revival, whatever, you know, whatever you want to, I don't really care what we call it, outpouring, revival. All these people get on there and it's like, oh, it's not technically a revival because when a revival happens, these, these five things has to have to happen. It's like, I don't care. Whatever we call it, it doesn't matter to me. The Holy Spirit was poured out. And it's not, I don't believe it's reserved whatsoever just for one place or one location. It is the beginning of the days of his presence. It's not limited to one location because he's coming to take over this entire earth. The Lord's presence is rising up here at the end of the age. I believe we are at the very beginning of that. And I know if you've been in the charismatic church for a long time, that has been something people have said for a long, long time. This is the beginning of that. This is the beginning of that. And, you know, the revival fades and just t crashes and burns. I know that. That's why I was, like, hesitant to go, okay, Lord, is this really, 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 really the beginning of that time period? And I believe it is. I just, and I'm going to share why in a minute. But I just believe we're, we're moving in this initial outpouring and that we're moving into Joel chapter 2, 28 through 29, that has, was partially fulfilled at Pentecost, but is, I believe, the greatest time of fulfillment is yet to come at the end of the age. And you and I get to be part of that. Incredible. That is going to lead into what the scriptures call the day of God's power. With a power displayed... That's greater than what Moses did when he confronted Pharaoh with the plagues. With a power displayed that's greater than the miracles the apostles worked in. It's going to be combined and multiplied on a global level and spread throughout the earth. Incredible power that we have never seen before in human history. Nothing like what is coming has ever happened in history. We are living in the most pivotal time in human history. That sounds crazy. But I'm telling you, that's the time we live in. We live in a time of time and a season of seasons. And so I just want to shift your thought, your paradigm to see, no, the Lord is rising up with great power. The Lord is rising up with great presence. And for the repentant, it's going to mean revival, restoration, reformation, and bridal readiness. But for the unrepentant, it's going to mean judgment and wrath. What God is doing in his presence is going to bring the earth to its knees. And Jesus Christ is going to return. We are living in those days. I just want you to think about this for a second. Turn to uh, Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. And you probably have read this before, but I want to... You know, you may know this. You may not know this. I just, there's an important thing I want to, I want to point out here. Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, is the Lord makes, this is during the days of Noah. And you know the story, and all flesh has become violent. All flesh has become corrupt. Verse 3, the Lord says, my spirit will not strive with man forever. Because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. Now, I used to read that. Maybe you still read it that way. I used to read that and go, okay, well, what that means is, you know, people used to live till they were 700, 800, 900 years old. And so God was making a pronouncement of judgment to say, okay, they're no longer going to live till they're 900 years old. They're now going to live till they're 120. That's the limit. But I don't believe that's what the Lord was saying. I believe the Lord was making a, a, a pronouncement of judgment to say the flesh of men have become exceedingly wicked and the countdown is on until I bring the, my wrath and that countdown is 120 days, 120 years. Because Noah needed that time to build the ark. Noah needed that time to call the nations to repentance. Noah needed that time, yet... Through all of that, only eight people were saved from God's wrath and God's judgment. 
And in the second coming, whenever, I believe whenever the Lord, or I believe that when the Lord initiates, I believe he has initiated, the Lord ha, I believe the Lord has initiated the days of his second coming. When the Lord initiates that, the countdown is on. There's no turning back. There's no delay. And I believe that period is whatever the number is, 10, 15, 20, 25 years. I don't know the number, but whatever that period is, it's going to be the gradual increase of the, of, of the presence and the glory of God. We live in the days of his presence. Just look at this for example. Ezekiel 38 verse 20 is, I think this takes place prior to the second coming. And the Lord says that all the men who are on the face of the earth will shake at my presence. I believe that's before the Lord comes back. That's incredible. The presence of God filling the earth by his spirit, shaking the earth, shaking all men are going to shake at the presence of God. Revelation 16, 16 talks about when the lamb, the, the sun is going to go dark and the moon is going to be turned into blood and the, the unrepentant of the earth are going to say, fall on us and hide us from the wrath of the lamb. His presence has come. See, the presence of God that's going to bring revival and restoration and readiness to the church is going to bring judgment and wrath to the unrepentant. And we've got to get our hearts right with God. Because he's coming, he is coming, and there is no longer a delay. So I'm just going to talk about this. I believe this outpouring of the Spirit of God that's coming the days of his presence. My favorite term for this is a bridal revival. I've heard different leaders use that term, but I love that. I think that, that best captures what God is doing. He's... His presence is coming to revive the bride and lead massive numbers of people to salvation. We're about to experience the greatest harvest in human history. I have no idea what the number is, but I know Revelation chapter 7 says it is, there is you can't even count the number of people that come unto the Lord from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Now, at the same time, there's going to be a great falling away. There's going to be both happening at the same time. But I believe it is a bridal revival. God himself is rising up. God himself is rising up. His presence is being poured out in increasing, gradually increasing measures that's going to lead from glory to glory to glory until it finally is the most intense glory we've ever seen. It's going to... We better start getting right with God because I tell you, if God came like that to the church in this present condition, many people would die. Ananias and Sapphira, they lied and they died. They lied and they died. That's the, that's the intensity of the glory of God that's coming into this earth. So we, we cannot, like Drew was saying, We've got to do business with God. We cannot play around with him. Because these, this casual day of being just able to do whatever we want to do in the presence of God, no, it could cost you your life. I'm serious. God is coming in power and in glory. And if you're not right with God, if you're living in sin and coming into his house where his glory is manifest, it could kill you. I don't think we're there yet. Yeah, that's a great way to grow your church. Hey, come to our church and you might die. <laughs> We're not there yet, all right? So if you're living in sin, repent, you know, but still. Uh, we're not there yet, but we're moving towards that time. I believe just from studying scripture that there's going to be three phases of this last day outpouring of the Spirit, three phases of the days of God's presence. The first phase, I believe, is the initial outpouring of the Spirit, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. I believe we're living in the initial beginning of the beginning of that initial outpouring of the Spirit. The second phase is what I've called the latter rain outpouring of the Spirit from Joel chapter 2. 
And the third phase is the day of God's power during the last three and a half years of this age. And so I just want to talk through that right now, just starting with phase one, the initial outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And you've probably heard the revival that broke out at Asbury College, Asbury University, February the 8th. It's like about 20 students that were hungry and desperate for God. They, after the chapel service, they waited and they said, we're going to stay a little bit longer. We're going to pray and we're going to worship. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit began to move. The president gets word of it and sends out an email to the university and says, hey, uh, worship is going on. Why don't you come and check it out? The news spread so quickly that people began to flock into this worship service. And then I don't remember, I don't know exactly, it's probably, I'm just going off the top of my head, two weeks or three weeks or whatever, they had nonstop worship. And I think it's like 50 to 70,000 people came to experience this outpouring. And I listened to a lot of different testimonies and a lot of different stories okay, Lord, what is this? What's going on here? And just a lot of people I really trust were like, hey, this is legitimate, okay? This is, this is for real. I heard one testimony of an Anglican. He's an Anglican charismatic priest. I didn't know that was possible. An Anglican charismatic priest. I have no idea how that works. I remember we were in Uganda one time and we had to do a conference and one side of the room was about 100 Pentecostals. The other side of the room was 100 Anglicans. And I'm like, okay, how do you even do this? Because, you know, we say one thing and the Anglicans are like sitting there, you know, brow, you know, just frustrated and mad. You say another thing, the Pentecostals are up there shouting and dancing and they're mad. You say another thing, they're mad and they're, you know, they're praising God. Well, they don't really talk much. They're like, amen. But I don't even know how you, be, that's not really the point of the story, but I don't know how you become an Anglican charismatic priest. However you do that, I praise God for it. But this man had a near-death experience prior to this revival, probably, I don't know exactly, but probably a few years before this revival. And he, a near-death experience where he went to heaven, he died, went to heaven, came back, and when he was, he was doing a testimony of this Asbury revival, and he said, the presence of God I felt at Asbury was just like heaven. I was like, oh my gosh. That is an incredible endorsement. That is an incredible endorsement. The, the heaven felt like this place. And so I don't think, you know, just think about this. I don't, you may know this, you may not know this, but this outpouring that happened in Asbury, they, they've, they've since said, okay, we're going to have to shut it down. They didn't shut the revival down. They said, we can't just keep doing this. Like the city, there was actually signs on the coming into the city that said revival capacity over limits and basically go home. This, this, this city of like 6,000 people can't handle this outpouring. And they, they, they said, okay, we're going to move this off site, off campus. But the main thing was like, listen, there's nothing. There, the thing I loved about this is there was not a bunch of bands and brands and, you know, celebrity Christianity. And there was a bunch of fog lights and stage lights and smoke machines, fog light smoke machines, skinny jeans, all that stuff. It was like this simple, pure worship. I love it. I love that. It was nothing complicated. It was nothing sophisticated. It was nothing fancy. It was like hungry hearts saying, Lord, we want your manifest presence. And they said, come, Lord Jesus. And he came in great, a great outpouring of his spirit. <sighs> But I want you to take note of this divine coincidence. At the very same time this Asbury revival was taking place, the Jesus Revolution movie was being released. And even going back to 1970, when, when Asbury had a revival, and it began, it, it, that revival began to help spur on the Jesus movement that was taking place in 1970. Which, if you want to know, like, okay, has that affect, what does that relate to me? Well, the modern day worship movement that we no longer sing hymns and, you know, all those kind of things, that modern day worship movement was birthed out of this Jesus movement. It was a great moving of the Holy Spirit. But at the very same time, there was this outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Asbury in 1970. There was a Jesus movement, Jesus people movement that was taking place on the West Coast that spread throughout this nation all around the earth. And you cannot make this up that the Holy Spirit begins to be poured out again in Asbury and 
the Jesus Revolution movie that tells that story are released at the same time. That is profound. You cannot make that up. God is trying to say something to us. It's just, just an incredible time to be alive. And so, again, why do I think, to borrow the words of, of Peter, why do I think this is that? Why do I think this is the beginning of the beginning of the last day outpouring of the Holy Spirit that's going to intensify, that's going to grow, that's going to expand? Why do I think that? Again, if, if you're old enough, you remember, okay, we've seen past revivals. We've seen proclamations by people that have said, okay, this is the beginning of the last day outpouring of the Spirit, and then it just totally crashes and burns. And you're like, okay, we're not, we're not going to go down that path again, and you become cynical. So I, I hesitate to even say this, but I really, really, really believe this. I really do. <clears throat> is the timing between the Asbury Revival and the Jesus Revolution movie at the release at the same time. You, you, again, you cannot make that up. Bob Jones, I don't know if you've heard of Bob Jones. You didn't heard of the prophecy Bob Jones had, I don't know, many years ago where he said, when the Kansas City Chiefs win the Super Bowl, God's apostolic chiefs are going to be released and it's going to bring in a worldwide revival. Now, the Chiefs won in, in, in 2020 and everyone's like, okay, where's this revival? I don't see it. It's not here. But think about this. That very week... We, on, on February the 8th, the, the Super Bowl Sunday is on, on the, what, the 13th or 12th or whatever, however many days it was. When that very week, when the Super Bowl is about to be played out, revival at Asbury begins to break out. The Kansas City Chiefs win the Super Bowl. Now, now catch this, history repeating itself. In 1970, the Asbury revival broke out and the Chiefs won the 1970 Super Bowl. In 2023, the Asbury Revival broke out, and the Chiefs won the, 2000, the 2023 Super Bowl. You can't make this up, okay? You cannot make this up. We're not trying to create anything. We've been there and done that, and trust me, we've been there, done it, bought the T-shirt. You cannot make this up. God is on the move. The Lord is on the move. There, I, and and the, another, another reason I believe, that I, just, I, I believe just studying the end of the age, the signs of the end of the age, I, have, I can't go into all that right now, just too much time, it would take too much time. Studying all these things, you realize, okay, we are, I, I am convinced we are living at the end of the age. However many years, 15, 20, 25, I don't know, could be shorter, could be longer, I don't know, I don't know. But as I've been praying about this, okay, Lord, okay, what are we supposed to do? What are you wanting us to do? I don't want to just go out and try to, like, copy what they're doing. And, you know, we've done, been there, done that, and, you know, bought the T-shirt of that. And it's like, oh, Lord, I don't want to do this. But, Lord, okay, what is it you are wanting to do with us in this local church? And I, I, just, I just sensed that the Lord was just put on my heart that, this outpouring of the Spirit is for who, whosoever is hungry and desperate. Whoso, whosoever is hungry and desperate. Like those 20 students who stayed after chapel and said, God, we are going to pray and we're going to cry out for the moving of your Holy Spirit. Whosoever is hungry and desperate can receive of this. It doesn't matter what denomination you're in. It doesn't matter your location. You don't have to travel. You know, sometimes, you know, if you, were, if you were around during the Toronto Blessing or the Brownsville Revival, you had to go to a certain location to go experience it and try to bring it back. And, you know, some people tried to bring it back, and it just got, a lot of it got kind of weird. Some of it was real. Some of it wasn't. You know, if you've been there, you saw that. You know what I'm talking about. But I don't believe this is something that you go there and you bring it back. I believe this is more of if you're hungry and you're desperate, God will pour out his spirit upon us. I think we just saw that today in our worship. We haven't had an ex the presence of God like that in a long time. I thank God for that. I thank God for that. I believe God's desire in this outpouring of the spirit is to make every single 
local church that's hungry and that will say, God, we're getting out of the way. We're laying down our agenda. We're laying down our, our plans, our schedule. That every single local church, that God will come with his abiding presence and he will fill the house of God, these living stones, with his glory and with his presence. I believe it's on God's heart that this present visitation we're experiencing in, the, in America and in the world is meant to go from visitation to habitation. It's not, just to be, it's not meant to just be a season where it, you know, it happens and it goes and you go back to your life, but it's meant to be a, an abiding habitation, the abiding glory, the abiding presence of the Lord. I also sense that it is also a test to the global church and to our church is are you hungry enough to do whatever it takes in your schedules, in your plans, and in your agenda, in the structure of your services to say, God, move the way you want to move. We're not going to limit it. It's also a test to see are you hungry enough when you get a taste of it like we just did to go, Lord, there's way more than that, way more of your presence that we can experience and to contend for it in prayer and fasting. That's where it confronts our lukewarmness, our self-satisfaction. Lord, I'm okay in my current condition. I'm okay. See, the problem is when you're lukewarm, you don't know you're lukewarm. You're blinded to your own lukewarmness, and you cannot see your current spiritual condition. That's why it's like lukewarmness, self-satisfaction. I'm not going to... I'm not going to press in. I'm not going to hunger. I'm not going to go for more. Just keeps you in that state of lukewarmness. See, I believe it's a test for are you hungry enough? Are you desperate enough? Are you going to let God move? Are you going to touch this thing? Or not this thing. Are you going to touch, try to touch the ark of the covenant and steady it and control it and try to use the moving of the spirit for your own ministry or your own glory? I'm just talking about the church around the, the nations. It's a test to see if you can handle the outpouring that's coming, because this is only the forerunner of it. <clears throat> God's going to test us. I don't mean like, I don't mean like a test like, I'm going to put you into a trial. I mean a test like, I'm coming. What is your response to this initial outpouring of my spirit? And I believe just today was a, was a fort, was an appetizer. An appetizer of the beginning of what we can experience in this place. <clears throat> and I thank God for it. We're moving into that time that Terry Bennett talked about, the Pentecost that is going to out-Pentecost Pentecost. I believe we're in the initial, I mean, there's, there's, there's many phases to it, but we're at the very, very beginning of the beginning. It's, I still believe that's some years out. But I believe we're moving into that, but the Lord's testing us. Okay, how much do you want me? How much do you want my presence? Because God's presence is going to disrupt everything about your life. <laughs> you cannot put God into a box. You cannot put God into a schedule. You cannot say, I'm going to try to fit Jesus into my life. If you want this moving of his spirit, these day, this day of his presence to be here in this local church, and we do, it's going to be, his presence is disruptive. He's not trying to fit into your plans and your agenda and your schedule. He's coming to move however he wants to move. And will, will I, will we, yes, God help us, will us, will we say, God, do whatever you want to do. This revival, whatever you want to call it, again, I, I hate to use the word revival because you always get those internet critics that are like, well, revival is really, these five things have to happen. What, this outpouring of the Spirit, this, whatever this is, this outpouring of the Spirit is vital to the bride being made ready. Dad and I could preach a thousand sermons about the need to be made ready, but unless the Spirit moves, that can never happen. This is a work that is not by might, it is not by power, but it is by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. What God is doing in the bride is a work of the Holy Spirit, and this, this outpouring of the Spirit of God is vital to the bride being made ready. 
We need his indwelling spirit to increase within us unto fullness. That's why we're doing the indwelling life class. We'll resume that next Sunday. We need his manifest presence among us to increase in fullness. And we need, we, and we need his anointing on us to increase in fullness. The spirit in us in fullness. The spirit among us in fullness. The spirit upon us in fullness. All of it. We want all the fullness of Jesus Christ. I keep calling it it. Lord, the Lord himself. The Lord himself. We want the Lord himself in fullness within us. We want the Lord in fullness among us corporately. We want the Lord in fullness upon us as an anointing for ministry and the way God would use us. So I believe that, just praying about this, I believe that the Lord is releasing wave after wave of his love to his church. The Lord is releasing wave after wave of his love to wash her, to heal her, to lead her to repentance. See, it's the kindness of God that leads you to repentance. It's the kindness of God that leads you to repentance. This outpouring of the Spirit is meant to be the kindness of God being poured out to lead you to repentance, to be healed, to be washed, to be refreshed, to be made whole so that you come back and I come back to that burning passion of first love as if, okay, it feels as if I've been born again, again. I believe God wants to bring us to that place. I believe in summary, this Asbury revival, this outpouring of the spirit that's now spread to, I don't know, over 20 college campuses. I don't know how many, just it's spreading and spreading. I believe that it's meant to be the catalytic spark that leads us into the greater outpouring mentioned in the book of Joel. Which brings me to the second phase of this outpouring. The latter rain outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the Pentecost, that out Pentecost, Pentecost. <clears throat> just, a, just a real quick note. The, you, may not, you may know this, you may not know this. The term latter rain movement, I don't know if you've heard of that term. It's a movement that was heavily criticized after World War II. When I use the term latter rain, I'm using it in the sense of of what I believe, and I'll show you in a minute, what Scripture teaches about the last day outpouring of the Spirit. I'm not talking about the latter rain movement that had, took place after World War II, so that may mean nothing to you. Just want to say that uh, wherever this message might go. But let's turn to Joel chapter 2, verse 28. <clears throat> it, it's a text that in the charismatic church we're very familiar with, and rightly so. It was Pentecost was the down payment or the initial beginning of this prophecy. I'm going to show you, if you can uh, be patient with me, that this prophecy is actually set in an end time context to, me, to show you that what the, the first century church experienced was only an initial foretaste or appetizer of what's reserved for the end time church and the end of the age. So Joel chapter 2, very important uh, book, uh, very important chapter. But Joel says in verse 28, he says, but it will come, it'll come about after this, that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. Just pause there for one second. I want you to take note of the phrase, it will come about after this. Okay, we're going to go back to that in a minute. But there is a precondition to this outpouring of the Spirit that has not yet happened. That's going to be the trigger event that leads to this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I will pour out, on my, I will pour out my Spirit on all mankind. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Okay. Take note, he said, that outpouring, which I believe Pentecost in the book of Acts was, the begin was a foretaste of that prophecy, is set in the context of the end of the age and end time prophecy. Now, I want to just, I know... 
I'm passionate about this, and I know teaching people sometimes, they don't share my passion. They might zone out in this, but I want to encourage you to pay close attention here to what I'm going to say, because I want to show you the context of this prophecy, because I have, I have just, you know, listening to so many different things over the years, I don't, I don't know anyone, I'm not saying it because, I'm not saying it like, oh, I have this special revelation. I'm just, I'm longing for more and more people to realize this, but it's a little bit confusing, so I just want to take just a second to show you this is an end time context, all right? So, let's look at Joel chapter 2, verse 32. Okay, I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to reverse engineer this prophecy, working our way backwards so we can understand the, the context of when this promise is going to come about. Now, verse 32 is at the end of this outpouring. Notice what it says. It will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be those who escape, even as the Lord said, among the survivors whom the Lord calls. That's clearly, clearly, if you know, if you know Bible prophecy, that's clearly talking about the time of Jacob's trouble that comes into the nation of Israel. It won't just come to the nation of Israel. It will come to all the nations. But it's, it's talking about when the Antichrist is, is on the earth in Jerusalem, there's going to be those who escape. There's going to be deliverance in Israel. So that's talking about the last three and a half years of the age. Does that make sense? That's clearly, clearly talking about that. Now, go up two more verses, and we'll, we'll start with verse 30. Is the Lord, this is, this is flowing out of this last day outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The Lord says, I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. That's talking about Revelation chapter 6, verse 16. When the Lamb breaks the sixth seal, the sun is darkened and the moon turns into blood. I believe it is a blood moon, like probably like we've never seen. That is a sign and a signal that says the day of the Lord, just to make it simple, the last three and a half years of the age have started. Okay? So you see, there's an outpouring of the Spirit that flows right into this sixth seal in the last three and a half years of the age. Does that make sense? That ultimately leads to the time of Jacob's trouble and the, la the great tribulation and Israel, you know, Israel going through the greatest trial and testing they have ever known in their history. You see that? So there's this flowing of the Spirit that goes directly to the sixth seal in the book of Revelation. Okay, hopefully that makes sense to you. You can look at the notes if you want to, if you want to just kind of study that. Now go back. So we know that this, this end time outpouring of the Spirit moves us into the last three and a half years of the age. Very, very clear to me on that. Now look at what it says here in Joel chapter 2, verse 28. It says, it will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. After what? It's after what Joel described in verses 18 through 27. What is it? It is an attack against the nation of Israel by what is called a northern army, an army from the north. Attacks Israel... And God promises, I'm going, to, I'm going to defeat the northern army. I'm going to put its vanguard into the eastern sea. I'm going to, put the, I'm going, to, I'm going to decimate it into a parched land in the nation of Israel and its rear guard in the western sea, the Mediterranean Sea, Mediterranean Ocean. I'm going to defeat this northern army that comes against Israel. And you can even, if you're sticking with me, you can even realize in the context when God defeats that northern army, what the Lord, I believe it's an Islamic coalition that comes against Israel in the last days that wants to destroy the nation of Israel. And Israel, as you know, since 1948, has been in this incredible conflict with the uh, Arab nations over who controls Jerusalem. They've been in this conflict since 1948. But I believe one of the culminating points of this conflict is here in Joel chapter 2, where God says, I am going to defeat this northern army. And then if you examine the context, you realize that, that when right before this happens, 
Israel is experiencing a grain shortage. They, they're, they're experiencing a bread shortage. That's why God says, I'm going to send you grain, new wine and oil. Read Revelation chapter 6, the, the third seal. Is the third seal strikes the grain and the barley. See, I believe, after studying this for years, I believe that this end-time attack against Israel, this northern army that attacks Israel, takes place during World War III when, when there's a food shortage. The barley, like it says in Revelation chapter 6, the barley and the grain are struck, and this that this, this, this attack happened somewhere between the third seal and the, yeah, the third seal and the sixth seal. So it's like right in there, right before the Antichrist, right before, you know, I'd say a few years before the Antichrist. You don't have to get, you know, get too technical about that. My point is we're moving. We're moving into that time. But I'm going to tell you, like, you know, when it talks about the end time outpouring of the Spirit, everyone's like, hey, this is that, this is that, this is that. You're going to know this is that, okay? It's going to be so very clear because you're going to see God do a supernatural work in Israel to defeat the northern army, and all the nations are going to look at this in awe when God magnifies himself in the sight of all nations. And it's then that God is going to bring a period of, of peace, a period of restoration, a period of prosperity to Israel, is in that context that God is going to pour out his spirit. Does that make sense? We're not far from that. I don't know how many years. We are not far from that time when the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit in history is released. The greatest number of people who come to salvation comes, but that's not yet the last three and a half years, or the seven, that's even not, I don't believe it's even the last seven years. I believe it's before that time period. But it's this initial outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I just want to show you real quick this chart, just so you can kind of see in a picture form here. Some people zone out when they see charts, but I, it helps me kind of, there's a lot going on. But I, I think just, just when you see the, the Antichrist system in the first seal begins to rise up. The second seal is World War III. The third seal is famine. The fourth seal is death. But, but, but starting at that time period, the Holy Spirit is being poured out. Then you see after this fourth seal, again, I'm not, gonna, I'm not claiming it's exactly this way, okay? So I'm, I'm laying it out as a framework to help us say, okay, this is kind of where this is moving. This is kind of where this is going. That when this northern army is defeated, the latter rain outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the last day outpouring of the Holy Spirit is released before the, last, before the Antichrist, Daniel 9, 24 to 27, makes a seven-year peace treaty with Israel. This is my view of things. Okay. That's probably some of you are like, what? Okay. The greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit is coming. You can go ahead and just black that out because other people will just not pay attention and trying to figure that out. But I'll email it to you. I'll email it to us. And we'll, 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 we'll post, it, we'll post this, this picture even on our, our YouTube mess for this message. But Joel 2.23 says, He has given you the early and the latter rain. Now, that is in the physical realm. The, the early rain was for the initial growth, the initial seeds. The latter rain was meant to bring those seeds unto harvest. What God's going to do in Israel physically, he's going to do in the nations spiritually. What Pentecost was as an early rain outpouring of the Holy Spirit was the initial seeds of growth. But what God's going to do in the latter rain outpouring of the Holy Spirit is going to, is going to bring those seeds unto maturity. The latter rain outpouring of the Holy Spirit is going to bring in the full maturing of the harvest. This is not just about millions of people getting saved. This is about the bride being made ready. 
This is about the mature sons of God coming forth unto full Christ-likeness, unto full stature of the mature man. This latter rain outpouring of the Holy Spirit is going to bring the harvest to maturity, to bring what God has wanted, what God has longed for. We talked about, I talked about that in the Eternal Blueprint book about God's eternal purpose. God's eternal purpose will be fulfilled in this last day outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It is vital. It has to happen. It can't just happen by good preaching or writing good books or whatever. It can't happen that way. It's got to, it's go, now that's not, that's a part, but it, it's, gotta, it's going to happen by the latter rain outpouring of the Holy Spirit to bring the harvest to maturity. Let's look at James chapter 5, verse 7. James said that, I'm reading from the New King James here, that therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Okay, what's he talking about? The coming of the Lord. The second coming of Jesus Christ. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. Catch that? The Lord's coming to get the, the fruit of the earth, the harvest, had to have the early rain, started on Pentecost. The latter rain, which is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the end of the age, Joel chapter 2, 28 and 29, that outpouring is vital to bring the harvest to maturity to transform God's children into mature sons of God that are, that are conformed into the image of Jesus Christ, to transform the bride and to make her ready for the bridegroom. That's why I love the term bridal revival because God's intention in this outpouring of the Holy Spirit is not to transform nations and conquer the seven mountains of culture. God's purpose in this end-time revival is to transform his bride and to make her ready for the bridegroom. The conquering of the seven mountains of culture will happen when Jesus comes back. This is a bridal revival for the church to make her ready and to bring in massive numbers of people. Like, I don't even know the number. Massive, massive, massive numbers of people into salvation and into readiness. Phase three... Okay, uh, show the next slide. Okay, this will really make your head spin. I don't, have, I don't have the time to develop the full thought of this, but you may have heard this before. But three and a half years, maybe a little bit before that, right at the three and a half year mark, Revelation chapter 12, the man child will be born. Revelation 12.10 talks about when that happens, I'm going to read this. Is now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come? For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. What that verse is saying is when, when the woman is pregnant, the, I believe it's the church, when the woman who is the church gives forth, gives birth to the man-child, the overcomers, those who are overcoming, like Jesus said in Revelation 2 and 3, when that happens, that will mark the day of God's power. And that is, when I talk about the day of God's power, I'm, ta I'm referencing uh, Psalms chapter 10, verse 5, the day of God's power. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. I know I'm just throwing out a bunch of stuff here that I've been meditating on for years, and you're like, I never heard this before. This is a lot, I know. But in the day of God's power, if you examine Revel or if you examine Psalms 110, the day of God's power is during the day of God's wrath, the last three and a half years of the age. What I'm saying here is that there is coming a time when the outpouring of Joel 2, 28 through 29, that outpouring moves into what Scripture calls the day of God's power. The greatest power, 
the world has ever known, released through a company of bond servants of God that will move in power like we've never seen before in history. I think you can read a Revelation chapter 11. You can see the two witnesses. I believe those two witnesses are Elijah and Moses. Others believe differently, but I, that's my personal conviction. They, they move in the last three and a half years of the age. They're in Jerusalem, and they have a prophetic ministry of incredible power. Even the Antichrist, who's ruling at that time, cannot do anything to them and shut them down. They have tremendous power. It's just, I think of it like Pharaoh and Moses. It's this confrontation between Pharaoh and Moses, where Moses is releasing plagues and Pharaoh is growing increasingly harder and harder. It's, it's similar to that, but this, this incredible prophetic ministry that these two witnesses have with great, unbelievable demonstrations of power, great demonstrations of power. But I don't believe that this end time ministry is, even though Revelation 11 is talking about the two witnesses and the ministry they will have, I believe it's also showing us a snapshot of what a company of witnesses will look like in this day of God's power who will have similar power and anointing to do the, the greater works of Jesus than we have ever known. <laughs> so that's, the, that's where we're moving into. All right. So, okay, just take a, just slap yourself on the face. I can see you're zoning out. We've got three phases. The initial outpouring, the, the latter rain outpouring, the day of God's power. <laughs> Go ahead and put to the black out that slide so you don't get distracted here. I want to end this message. Now, just preachers, when they say, I want to end this message, don't ever take that to heart because that usually means there's like 15 or 20 more minutes. But the last part of this message, just pay attention. This is where it gets real important, okay? It's okay, Lord, how do we respond? How do we respond? Okay, we're living at the beginning of this initial outpouring of the Spirit. Okay, Lord, how do we respond? What do we need to do? How do we position ourselves? And I believe the Lord is laying on my heart for this church that God will pour out His Spirit upon us if we are hungry and desperate. If you're satisfied where you are, if you're okay, I mean, you can love the Lord and you can be born again and you can know the word, but you can, and I can easily grow lukewarm to where we're like, I'm okay if we just have a little bit of God's presence. It's okay. Well, we probably won't have very much of his presence. If you're satisfied with where you're at, and that wine is good enough for you, you won't have the new wine that's coming. <clears throat> so ask yourself, I ask myself, how hungry, how desperate am I for the fullness of God's presence he's now pouring out? See, are we going to emulate the, the 20 students who stayed after to cry out to God? Or are we okay with a little measure of the Holy Spirit? Number two, as I believe God will pour out a spirit, close your ears, you may not want to hear this, if we will devote ourselves to prayer, hold on, let me say it this way. If we will devote ourselves to corporate prayer and fasting. I said the F word. Man, that's not popular in the church. Fasting. If we will devote ourselves to corporate prayer and fasting, you can go back and look at Joel. Is the end time outpouring of the Holy Spirit is absolutely related to corporate prayer and fasting. There's an, a, a sense of urgency. I, I'm, I won't go through all the, the notes of this because of time short. But corporate prayer and fasting. Lord, would you pour out your spirit upon us? 
Lord, would you pour out your spirit upon your church and the nations? Lord, would you increase the intensity of your presence? God, we must have you, the spirit and the bride, say, come, Lord Jesus. Come in a great outpouring of the spirit. Come in the manifestation of your glory. Come in greater increase. See, crying out to the Lord in prayer and fasting. Okay, close your ears. We feel like as a leadership team that the Lord is calling us to start praying and fasting every Wednesday at, at 6 p.m. So whereas we had the, the prayer and fasting Wednesday and Thursday of the last week of the month, we feel like now it's now going to be moved to every Wednesday at 6 p.m. with prayer and with fasting. Okay, some of you are like, ugh. I felt that way too when I was feeling like the Lord saying this to me, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable. I like my routine, all right? So I, I was sitting there going, Lord, you know, my life is already really busy. I'm just being honest with you. My life's really busy. You know, to, to drive here takes 30 minutes, and then, you know, it takes an hour and a half, and then 30 minutes back. That's about like two and a half hours, sometimes three hours, because you guys love to talk to each other, and we can never get out. I'm kidding about that. Um, but I was just thinking, okay, three hours every single week of my life is already busy, and the Lord's like just confronting me. You're telling me you would rather get in your comfortable chair and get on your iPad and watch YouTube videos or whatever it is, I don't, whatever I'm watching, streaming or whatever. You would rather do that than cry out to God for a, a, the, the prophesied end time move of the Holy Spirit. Now we'll pray for other things. We'll pray for America. We'll pray for Israel. We'll pray for the crisis that's going on in the nations. We'll pray for Issues like that. So, you know, I'm not saying it's only praying for the outpouring of the Spirit. We're praying for the bride to be made ready. But will you, can you get out of your routine and do that? And here's what I believe the Lord spoke to me. Is this weekly Wednesday night prayer meeting is the most important thing you do. Even more, so for me, even more important than my writing, more important than, my, than our mission work, more important than messages, even more important than our Sunday gatherings because prayer is the fuel for what God wants to do among us. And so I just, you know, I just want to encourage you. I just want to challenge you. I don't want anyone to feel like, okay, you know, we've, we've been there, done that, where you have that whole thing of like condemnation if you don't go. I don't want anyone to feel any kind of condemnation. I know some people live very, very far away. Dylan and Rachel are like an hour and a half away. You know, people live very, very far away. Work schedules don't permit this. So if it doesn't work out for you to make it, Lord, don't get under any condemnation, all right? Just what I'm asking you to do, here's what I'm asking you to do is is ask the Lord what level of commitment he's requiring of you. Maybe if you're married with small kids, the Lord's saying, okay, why don't you, the husband, go one week and the wife go the next week? Maybe the Lord's saying you go two weeks. Maybe the Lord's saying you go every week. I, I don't know. I don't know what the Lord's saying. My, my thing is like, okay, just ask the Lord, Lord, what are you saying for me to do? What are you saying for me to do? Lord, what level of commitment are you challenging me to? You know, when, when Joel was talking about it, and I'll get to this in a minute. I'll actually, I'll get that in one second. We live in the most pivotal time in human history, and we can shape history through prayer and fasting. We can shape the end time move of the Spirit through prayer and fasting. History belongs to the intercessor. And so we're also, during that time, we're going to have some time. We'll have time in, the, in these times of worship, of waiting on the Lord. We'll have time of just seeking him and stuff like that. We'll have time of intercession. But just want to just say, you ask the Lord what he's mentioning to you. Number three, 
if we, if we will surrender our comfortable routines to seek him. See, some of our routines, like, like me, I just mentioned my, my routine. You know, once, once a week or once a month, I could come out for two nights. That was okay. Now it's three hours every week. I've got to get out. God was confronting my routine. I believe God will confront your routine. Is my challenge to us is will we break out of our comfortable routines to gather together for prayer and fasting to seek the Lord for a greater outpouring of the Spirit? And I would also add to pray into all the issues of our day which are piling up. We are in a, we're in an international crisis right now. We're, we're, we're in, we're in, I believe, some of the most serious times we've ever faced. I believe even potentially more serious than World War II. We need to pray. We need to pray. Then the fourth thing I'll say is for us to have a corporate expectation that God will pour out his spirit here. Okay? We just, we, okay, listen, we just witnessed a moving of the Holy Spirit today. Is there more? Yes, there's a lot more, but I'll take that as a star. That was, that was precious. God touched many people. <laughs> God healed hearts. God restored. God gave you a sense of his love and his presence. It was, it was really sweet. I just want us to have a corporate expectation, not just 10 or 15%, more like 70, 80% of us to be like, God is going to do it here. I don't mean like a name it, claim it kind of thing, but a, a confident expectation that we have been prepared as a corporate body for many years for this time, and we will not be passed by. And not to limit it like, okay, we're going to say, it's going to be like this, it's going to be like that. It's going to be unique to who God's made us to be. We're not trying to be anyone else. We're not trying to be this church or that church or trying to do what they're doing or we're doing. We know very clearly who we are. We're not trying to copy or emulate, but we're like, God, do it here. I just want to raise our expectation level up in great faith to, to know God will do it here if we will respond with faith, hunger, and desperation, corporate prayer, and fasting. So in conclusion, this is actually for real, in conclusion, I believe it's, it's time for this church to seek the Lord for a fresh move of the Spirit in our hearts and our homes and in our gatherings. If we do, if we respond with corporate prayer, fasting, worship, and waiting, I think we are going to position ourselves for this present outpouring of the Spirit and the latter rain outpouring of the Spirit that is coming soon. Amen. Amen. Father, we ask you, Lord, I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the times in which we live. Man, thank you. Lord, I pray for everyone who's listening, whether in person or online, I pray for a spirit of wisdom and a spirit of revelation. Lord, that we would have a revelation of the hour of history we live in. And Lord, I pray that you would get, about, get us out of our lukewarmness. Just since even, I hadn't thought about this, but I sense even, the Lord just brought this thought to my mind. I sense even the Lord had us as a church studying the church of Laodicea last Sunday, wanting to, stir, wanting to confront our lukewarmness for this time and what God wanted to do among us. So I'm praying, Lord. Thank you. We, I, I, that just hit me. Couldn't orchestrate that. Lord, I pray right now that you would confront our lukewarmness. Lord, confront our lukewarmness, Lord. I pray that we would not be self-satisfied. 
I pray that we would not be content where we are. I'm asking you, Lord, just receive this right now. I believe the Lord wants to give you a gift of hunger. If you want the gift of hunger, just raise your hands with open hearts, open hands to receive right now. Lord, would you give us right now, those who are listening online, would you give us the gift of hunger right now, Lord? God, give us the gift of hunger. Lord, maybe one of the most precious gifts you can give us is an insatiable hunger that can only be satisfied with your presence, your spirit, and your word. Lord, I pray for the hammer of God to go and, and just begin to smash down, Lord, the satisfaction that we have become so easily satisfied, even with a light, a, a tiny little touch of your presence. Let us not be satisfied. We want fullness, Lord. Give us fullness. 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 Break up the hard areas, Lord, of routine and satisfaction and comfort and prosperity that has lulled us to sleep and made us comfortable, Lord. Bring your hammer and, and smash to pieces those things that are keeping us satisfied, we pray. Lord, I pray that you would just put inside of us the gift of hunger. And Lord, I pray, even what Dad prayed just a few weeks ago, that God would give us the spirit of grace and the spirit of supplication. And I pray that for those listening online, that God would give you the spirit of grace and the spirit of supplication that you might be able to labor in prayer and stir up within us the spirit of prayer. Stir up again the spirit of worship among us, Lord. This thirst for the presence of God. Hallelujah, Lord. Lord, I just say, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Before we stop, just Dad's going to share.